finish up our look at study Bibles this morning. We still have a lot of those to do. We've only done the first. I want to try to finish up our look at study Bibles this morning. We still have a lot of those to do. We've only done the first three. There's only one other one I want to spend very much time on, which will be number seven. But I think you'll have a good review, even though we've only spent a couple of hours, a couple of weeks on study Bibles, that just how many of them are available. I have a whole lot of these, most of these. Uh, I didn't bring all of them, but I brought a large number of them. Let's go back then to where we were. We're on number four. We're doing them in chronological order, which takes us back um, at the, really at the beginning of, of this century. And number four was entitled, The Campbell Morgan Analyzed Bible. The Campbell Morgan Analyzed Bible of 1912. Now it is the work of the famous preacher and author G. Campbell Morgan. And so he had his own type study Bible, and we have seen this to be true in uh, modern times as well. Uh, various preachers doing works, and we'll say more about that here in a moment. This was simply the KJV. <coughs> Remember, study Bibles take an existing translation, and then they do something with it. Which had added Morgan's own topical headings and his references, some outline maps, and an analysis and spiritual interpretation of each book. So those are just kind of some standard things. It wasn't a study Bible in the sense of notes on each verse at the bottom of a page or in a center column reference, but you've got various headings and cross references that were of his own devising. Some maps, now again, not maps that are found in the back of most Bibles, but outline maps that maybe outline the teaching of a book or the teaching of a chapter as well as just a general kind of introduction to a book and it would be an analysis of his spiritual interpretation. Kind of introduction to a book and it would be an analysis of his spiritual interpretation. And that was referred to as the Campbell Morgan Analyzed Bible. And then number five, the New Testament for Fishers of Men. I'm skipping over just dozens of study Bibles. I'm just picking some out in different eras or generations. The New Testament for Fishers of Men, 1943, so I've skipped over a, a number of years there. The New Testament for Fishers of Men. Now this has sections on personal evangelism and soul winning, how to be an effective soul winner in the kingdom. So under <clears throat> verses, like verses that would speak about being fishers of men, Matthew 4.19. Uh, then you'll have little comments on how to win someone to Christ. Uh, and you've got book outlines, you've got daily readings and devotional studies, and a lot of other things included. But the important thing is the emphasis in this little study Bible on methods of, of effective soul winning. Then number six, the Divine Healing Bible. The Divine Healing Bible, 1957. 1957. Again, this is just a KJV. Most of these are just KJVs. This is the KJV, which has what they call helps on healing, how to get your healing and maintain your healing. So it was done by the Pentecostal Church. Helps on healing, helps on salvation, and helps on miracles. I threw that one in. Well, for two reasons, because number seven is going to be a little bit similar. It comes right after it. And, and secondly, because I want to show you that there were study Bibles done, well, way back in these early years, 1957, by Pentecostal people who wanted to underscore the fact that the Bible does, the New Testament anyway, does have a very large emphasis on healing and deliverance and the supernatural. And too many times, study Bibles are done by you know, the evangelicals or, well, even liberals, but they're done by people who uh, believe more in higher education than Pentecostals. But Pentecostals aren't trying to educate you here in too many technical matters, just in the practical matters of healing, and salvation, deliverance, and the supernatural. And that then brings me to number seven, Dave's Annotated Reference Bible of 1961. This, this is unique, Dakes, D-A-K-E, <coughs> Finis Dake, F-I-N-N-I-S, Dake's Annotated Reference Bible of 1961. Now this is unique.
unique among study Bibles. It's still in print today. It's one of the best-selling study Bibles today. I mean, it's behind Ryrie and NIV and things like that, but it's at least on the list. And by the time we're going to be through, we'll probably have mentioned 40 or 50 different study Bibles that don't appear on the list. But Dakes is still in print. It's still up there. And what makes, you say, well, what makes Dakes unique? Well, Dakes is clearly the most scholarly, exhaustive study Bible with a direct charismatic theology behind it. Dake was a Pentecostal pastor and evangelist. As far as I know, it can be obtained through CBD, Christian Book Distributors. They carried it last time I checked in their catalog. Dake's Annotated Reference Bible. It's a huge work. I think Brother Jim Simons has one. You can see his if you're <coughs> interested in uh, thinking about purchasing Dake's. But Dake was a scholar, and his Bible is the most exhaustive one with the direct charismatic theology behind it. In other words, number six, the Divine Healing Edition, just has a few little, you know, thoughts or notes, helps on healing. But Dakes is um, rather complex. It's kind of like Schofield. He goes into extensive discussion of all different types of matters. I mean, even in geography and history and other areas. But where he really leaves his mark is when he intersects, when he comes across those passages that deal with healing or with deliverance or with charismatic teaching and theology. And his is the only one that I know of that really deals with those matters from a charismatic point of view. As I say, all the other study Bibles, for the most part, are done uh, by people who are not Pentecostals, who are more or less involved in the evangelical uh, church world. Dakes is a big Bible uh, with small print. It's like Thompson Chain Reference. It has two center columns, and it has two outside columns per page, one for text and one for notes. And the print can be rather small. There are all different types of varieties, as we'll see here in a moment, of Dake's, uh, we'll call it his study Bible. It's really the Dake's Annotated Reference Bible. But they're hardbacks and real leather and fake leather and just all different types. So let me give you a little background about this man, uh, Dake. Uh, he's an interesting figure. He has died just recently, a couple of years ago, as a matter of fact. But he was a... Southern Pentecostal evangelist and pastor uh, way back at the, almost the turn of this century. He lived to be a ripe old age. But back during the early and mid-decades of this century, his name was Finnis Dake, F-I-N-N-I-S. We're going to spend just a little more time here because it's important to, to know that there's a charismatic study Bible available today, one that's rather extensive. Now, what led him to the production of this study Bible was the fact that whenever he went to the platform to teach, and he was often known for teaching on prophecy, teaching in prophecy conferences, but he would take him one of these huge Bible timelines. I saw one advertised in a magazine just the other day that's about, well, the one I saw was about 16 feet long, called $39.99 if you want to purchase it. And it puts everything in, in biblical history on a timeline. Well, of course, you've got to be able to stand before a 16-foot wall to look at the thing. Well, he took a 30-foot Bible timeline with him up to the platform. I don't know how he ever got that scroll on roll or how anyone ever saw it, but maybe that's why it was so long. He had to write big so people could see it. But 30 feet across the platform, like a banner up there that you see in most conferences, you'd have the Dake's Bible timeline showing all Bible prophecy, prediction, and fulfillment, and various millennial and tribulational views, and all these types of things you'd find up on that. Just showing people how things fit together in the Bible. And so, uh, he got kind of tired of toting that scroll around with him and trying to unroll it, and so finally he decided the best thing to do is just incorporate all of this into some notes in a study Bible. So that's what led him to this. You've got to start with this uh, 30 feet long Bible timeline up on the platform. Now, his son estimates that Dake spent 100,000 hours working on this chart or this timeline of his. 100,000 hours during a period of 50 years. 
you know, refining and then refining again all of the particular minute points on this timeline. And then the final process of getting that all incorporated into what would become notes for his Bible, his son said, took seven years of work, early morning to midnight, six days a week, 52 weeks out of the year. Dake was quite a, a Bible student himself. He wasn't any slouch, that's for sure. Seven years of work from early morning to midnight, six days a week, getting together. If you ever study eschatology, you'll see how you can easily spend that much time. Uh, Double-checking all your references and, and making sure that you understand what Daniel said versus what Zechariah versus Isaiah versus Zephaniah versus John in the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, had to say. It can be a, just a, a time-consuming, exhausting type of endeavor. And so finally, he had all of the work ready, and I guess he, he had, kind of had a, has a story like uh, Kenneth Taylor, didn't have anyone to publish it, and didn't know what to do, and so he just kind of started out in his own home. His home became a shipping company, and he finally located a local printer in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, who was willing to do the work, and so 1961, just about 30 years ago, in 1961, uh, this Bible was ready. Now, Dake wasn't that well known. I don't think Dake is is that well known today. I mean, you don't see him on the big tickets uh, speaking at some conference or something like that. Uh, and that's because he's more of a scholarly type, or he was before his recent death, but was more of the scholarly type. He'd rather stay home and write and let his writings, and he published numerous books. Uh, one of the, the most important one, his annotated reference Bible, let his books, let his notes, let his reference Bible do the talking for him. In 1974, he moved his company from Atlanta to Lawrenceville, Georgia, where it is still today. They're known as Date Bible Sales. They're located in Lawrenceville, Georgia. 1987, last year, Venice Dake died at the age of 84 of Parkinson's disease, of all things. I spent your whole life in Pentecostal theology and teaching. I have a world-famous Bible here, a study Bible, with notes on divine healing. He died last year, 1987, at the age of 84 of Parkinson's disease, and his wife died that year also, 1987. But, of course, over the years, his children and his grandchildren also have really been the ones who have run the outfit, the Bible sales. He was too old to do anything at the age of 84, and his children and grandchildren had taken over some, some time ago. And they tell us that they put out, uh, you can contact them in Lawrenceville, Georgia, they put out 372,000 Bibles. In 19 different forms. You ought to see the list of, you can have date just about any way you want it, with coffee or with ice cream. 19 different forms of Dave's annotated reference Bible. <clears throat> so if you own one, you're 18, you don't own it. It's all different sizes and shapes and colors and for different people and just <clears throat> 372,000 Bibles, 19 different forms, as well as 180,400 copies of his books. He has just various books on doctrine and Pentecostal theology. Now this isn't, of course, per year. Now this is uh, since they've been selling about 30 years ago. They've sold... We're getting up to almost a half a million copies of Dave's Annotated Reference Bible. Some of you haven't even heard of that. But it's a, it's a well-known study Bible, especially among, I would say more among Pentecostals and Charismatics. Charismatics would be more inclined to use one of the other study Bibles. But Pentecostals from, you know, the old Pentecostal order, the old Pentecostal churches, I think would be a lot more familiar with, uh, with Dave's Bible. Now let's look at some features of, of Dake's work. 
it is worth having. I think you can still obtain it from CBD. You can probably find one of those El Cheapo editions. You don't have to have the genuine leather, about $80 or something. You can find an El Cheapo edition. But it's worth having if for no other reason it has a charismatic theology behind it. And you won't find that with your other study Bibles. So whenever he gets near miracles or something, he's not going to be explaining that away or sowing some skepticism or doubt in your mind about this. He believes all of that. He believes all of those accounts. And he doesn't just believe them in the sense they happen, you know, in the second millennia B.C. or in A.D. 100, but he believes that those are going to be happening today as well. So he deals with most of the charismatic passages. And when we say charismatic, we mean things that charismatics are known for that just a regular normal Christian should be known for. But because people who don't have the baptism aren't normal Christians, they're not known for that. Healing and deliverance and miracles and the like. He deals with most of those fairly thoroughly and fairly well. So I don't think, and, and there's nothing wrong with, uh, I mean, Dake's a Pentecostal, so he has his own problems. He doesn't have the total message like we would have it here or something. But I don't think I need to spend a lot of time saying what is right about Dake. It's good standard Pentecostal charismatic theology in, in charismatic areas. And when I say a statement like that, if I say it's good charismatic theology, that's the only type the Bible knows anything about. The Bible doesn't know anything about Wesleyan theology or Baptist. The only thing it knows is charismatic. So he's going to support what the Bible says. He believes what the Bible says on many, many different things. So rather than spend a lot of time on what is good with Dake, I'm going to mention a few things that are not good about Dake. Because I could spend forever saying what is good. You could turn to any of the charismatic texts and he's going to have a lot of good things to say about it. So rather than spend our time on that, let's just mention a, a few warnings concerning your use of Dake's annotated reference Bible. In the first place, you may recall or you may not remember, but years ago in our creation class, I was critical of Dake's Bible because he held to a form of the gap theory back in Genesis chapter 1. And of course, on that point, we were also critical of Schofield. That has been five or six years ago. You may not remember me mentioning Dave, but I did then, that Dave held to a form of the gap theory. So, of course, the problem, and I think I said this last time with Schofield and me mentioning something like that, is since well, now you're, you just know a lot more about, you just know a lot more about a lot of things now. In those days, you hear me say something critical about something or someone, and you just think nothing but a critical thought about them. Just, you know, okay, they're obviously wrong. Now you understand how you can point out something wrong about someone and something right about them. Dake has a lot of right things, thankfully more right things than wrong things about him. But I did make negative statements down his alley because he deserved to be criticized. The Bible doesn't teach any form of the gap theory. Schofield did and Dake did and a whole lot of other people do today. But the Bible doesn't know anything about a gap theory. So Dake was wrong in that area. So he was wrong. So we know that. So let's go on. Number two, something else, another feature. A negative one about Dake. He teaches a post-tribulational rapture. Now that's kind of strange. Not a lot of people. Pentecostals are known for being pre-trib. A post-tribulational rapture. You get into his notes on eschatology. That is, there won't be any Christians who escape the Great Tribulation, who escape any portion of the period known as the seven-year period of tribulation. But the church will go through the tribulation, and there will be a rapture at the end of the tribulation. It's called post-tribulational rapture. <clears throat> There are a lot of problems with that theory. It doesn't square with the biblical teaching. But you know, without going into that, I would think that common sense would cause us to pause over a wholesale post-tribulational rapture. Because if you are pre-millennial, how can you really be post-trib? Because see, if you're pre-millennial, you're saying that Christ is going to come to the earth, going to return prior to the millennium. And you know that the millennium follows the tribulation period. So why would the saints being ra be raptured at just about the same time Jesus is coming down? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense there. You need to get them raptured sometime earlier, at the beginning of the tribulation or halfway through the tribulation, to get all of them raptured at the end if you're pre-mill. And you see, you can have people who are kind of like on-mill, post-trib, or post-trib, post-mill. That would work really well. 
uh, or something along that order. When you're pre-mill and post-trib, those, those things, in my mind anyway, kind of cancel one another out. But of course, I know what Dank's thinking is. His thinking is, 1 Thessalonians 4, the saints are going to be raptured. As Christ is coming down, the saints are going up, and they meet one another in the air. Paul tells us that they meet one another in the air. As Jesus is coming down, at the end of the tribulation, just prior to the millennium, according to his theology, Jesus is coming down, the saints are going up, and they meet halfway between earth and heaven in the clouds. And then Jesus continues his descent to the earth. And so the saints who went up, popped up, they come right back down like a jack-in-the-box, up and down. They go up, meet him, come right back down. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. It seems like you need to somehow get at least some of the saints out of the tribulation. Verses like um, uh, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10, where Jesus promises that those who keep the word of his endurance will be kept from the hour of trial, which shall come upon all the world to try on all the earth to try them that dwell upon the face of the whole earth. And there are other scriptures as well that would seem to indicate that at least some of the saints are not going to be here during the tribulation period. So be careful there with his eschatology. His Bible teaches a, a post-trib rapture. Then in the third place, now, now those two things you, you couldn't guess. You wouldn't know about day. But here are a couple of things that you probably could guess because they are kind of typical of, of Pentecostal people. If you look at his commentary on the 10th chapter of John, well, let me just read to you in the KJV kind of what I'm talking about there so I can explain it with some background and some understanding. John 10 and verse 25, and Jesus answered, I told you and you believe me not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and neither shall any pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no one is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Well, in his commentary on John 10, he contains good, now you're saved, now you're not, Pentecostal theology. Or I could say bad, now you're saved, now you're not, Pentecostal theology. In other words, he does not believe in the Reformed doctrine of eternal security. The believer can never be secure in his salvation until death. He teaches that there are certain things which you must do and you must continue to do in order to be given the gift of eternal life. Well, of course, there is a fine line in Scripture on this point, but I just contradicted what myself and what I just said right there. He contradicted himself. There are certain things you must do and continue to do in order to receive the gift of eternal life. Paul said, if it's of works, then it's not of grace. And he just said there are certain things you must do in order to receive the gift of eternal life. There is a balance. We're told in 1 John chapter 5 that the elect, the saved ones, keep themselves, keep themselves from the wicked one. And yet we're told in 1 Peter 1 that we are kept by the power of God unto salvation, ready to be revealed. There is a fine line of distinction in the Bible, but the Bible does not teach a now you're saved, now you're not Pentecostal theology when you can, where you can never know if you are saved or not, and you're always down at the altar getting reborn again, getting re-saved again. The Bible tells us, uh, for instance, in 1 John 5 and verse uh, 13, that we can know that we have eternal life. Amen. John tells us in 1 John 5 and verse 13, this is the reason I'm writing, so that she can know that she have eternal life. We can know that we have eternal life. We don't have to be guessing about it or insecure, unsure over that matter. We can know that we have eternal life. Now, we, we can also know at the same time that God expects us to live a holy life. Those things are not in contradiction to one another. But we can know that we are saved 
and that we're not going to become unsaved tomorrow and get resaved the next day only to become unsaved again. Pentecostal theology generally has you down at the altar every other service or so getting reborn again. Now a person can backslide or sin and need to be forgiven of the Lord and come back into fellowship, but to say that you can have your salvation today, lose it tomorrow, get it the next day, lose it the next day, that's not what the Bible teaches. And of course you really wouldn't want to put a note like that in John 10, except John 10 is so strong he's trying to explain it away. John 10, 29, my father which gave them me is greater than all and no one, no one, including the one that we're talking about who says that they're saved or who is saved, and no one is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. He said, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, they follow me, and I give them eternal life, verse 28, and they shall never perish. They shall never perish. They says, well, now, if you've got eternal life, but you sin in your life, or you don't have the fruits of salvation, then, you see, the Bible would probably have another way of explaining the event. It would probably say you were never saved to begin with. Or it would say you're out of fellowship with God, and you're being chastened of the Lord. But see, Dave doesn't give one of those two answers. Dave says you lost your salvation. Not you never were saved, but you lost what you had, and now you need to get it back. That's not what Jesus teaches them. He teaches they shall never perish. Amen. Now, he doesn't say that they won't go through maybe some judgment in heaven. Paul talks about that, judgment for believers' words, that they might go through some chastisement in this life. The Bible doesn't say we won't experience those things. What it does say we won't experience is the experience of perishing, perishing eternally. You'll never perish. Not if you're one of his sheep, you'll never perish. You'll just never perish. You may fall out of fellowship and sin. Peter did that, but Peter didn't perish, though. Judas did perish because Judas was never in it to begin with. Judas didn't lose his salvation. He was never saved. If he was saved, he wouldn't have lost it. He would have repented the same way Peter did and gotten back in the fold. Or he wouldn't have and just died somehow in that state and he would have lost all rewards in heaven. And his experience would have been what Paul wrote of in 1 Corinthians 3, saved yet so as by fire, that his works were burned up, but he can't be burned. The person who's lost will be burned in the second death, but the person who's saved will not be burned, although his works may be burned up. So it's strange that he puts a note like that in John 10, except John 10 is so strong teaching eternal security that he has to try to refute it at that point. And then in the fourth place, another fault with today. See, he picked that up from his Pentecostal background there. Another fault with today is like most Pentecostal, he, he is Arminian. He is Arminian in his views of predestination and election. Of course, that's an Arminian view in verse 3. We can just say he's Arminian in his theology. But I'll be a little more specific with what form of Arminian teaching we're talking about under number 4. He's Arminian in the way that he explains predestination. He explains it in the typical Arminian way, which is a weak, watered-down view. And there are various expressions of the Arminian doctrine of predestination, which is just light years apart from the biblical doctrine, such as in Ephesians chapter 1, the biblical doctrine of predestination. For instance, one of the Arminian interpretations or understandings of predestination is that God has predestined that there will be a certain number of people saved at any time or throughout history or in a certain generation, that God has predestined a number like 419. Who makes up that number does not have anything to do with God. That's up to the people themselves. You see, God will just say, I want, you know, four million people or two billion people down through all the church's ages, uh, th down through all man's history. I want them to be with me in heaven. Now, is it going to be John Smith or will it be uh, Mary Doe? Well, I don't know, God said. I, I haven't picked which one of those it will be. I just predestined, and you see, here's how they water and twist this doctrine of predestination down. I predestined there would be a certain number, but it's up to the person, whosoever wills. They'll use those verses on you. It's whosoever will. 
God hasn't chosen some people to salvation and rejected other people because that'd be unfair. That's good Arminian theology there. But he simply said there'll be a certain number of people saved. And it's up to them to kind of save themselves, make sure that they are a part of that number. Or another way that predestination is often explained, predestination and uh, election, is that God looks down through history and observes a person's response to the gospel. It'd be unfair for him to elect them before the foundation of the world in the sense that their choices are caused by his divine power. It's called monergism in theology versus synergism. But we won't get into those other technical terms. I don't even know if Dave would know those terms himself. But, you know, let's say that um, uh, Bill Smith, the Baptist evangelist, God knows, God before the foundation of the world knew that Bill Smith, the Southern Baptist traveling evangelist, would be preaching in whatever place, um, Fort Smith, Arkansas, on the 3rd of June in 1992. And God knew that, and God knew the people who would be there. He would knew that, knows the people who would be there, and he's going to be preaching a salvation message. And so God looks down through history, and so they explain this as being the teaching on God's foreknowledge in, Bible, in the Bible. He looks down through history and sees which of those people present in that evangelistic service receive the message and believe on Christ. And then God quickly then reverts back to before the foundation of the world and elects him. He had to look forward to see who would love him and who would choose him. And then he goes backwards real quickly to say now they have been elected or predestined from the foundation of the world. Of course, that's not scriptural because the Bible says that ye have not chosen me, but, but I have chosen you. Amen. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Amen. It's a twisting of the doctrine of election and predestination. And so here's a quote from Dake on this business. You have to read this carefully or you'll think, well, that doesn't sound too bad or that's more or less what I believe. God has predestined all children of God to be adopted into his family. But who becomes the child of God is left up to each individual. There's just a measure of truth to it to be deceiving. The Bible does say, and whosoever will, and whosoever believes in him, John 3.16 doesn't say anything about God electing and causing some people to believe, giving them the gift of faith and causing them to believe. It just says God loved the world and he made his provision and now it's up to you. And now whosoever will can have eternal life and he won't have to perish, he'll receive eternal life. God has predestined all children of God to be adopted into his family. Here's even a third subtle twist on the doctrine of predestination. But who becomes a child of God is left up to each individual. That has nothing to do with God. That's not a part of his plan. It's not covered by his sovereignty. It's really not covered even by predestination, whether or not you become a child of God. If you choose Christ, or if you choose to accept him as Lord and Savior, if you choose God, or if you choose one morning to wake up and say, I'm going to get saved today. Once you choose to be God's child, then what is predestined is that he's going to receive you. That's all that he's saying. You know, that you won't be cast out. That if you choose to accept him, then he will choose to accept you. Pentecostal theology, I'm afraid. It's not biblical theology, though. It sounds very similar to uh, a person I knew a few years ago. They were charismatic, Pentecostal, and they didn't have any good theological training. They weren't even aware of really the terms or the fact that the terms had entrenched, established definitions. You know, like uh, green or red or yellow, they have definitions that, that you just can't change and say, well, red equals black. And I was talking to this man who was a pastor on one occasion concerning election, and he found out that I believe that the biblical view of election, the old Calvinistic doctrine of election, that God elected without foreseeing anything, that it's all of grace and not of works at all, and he said, no, he said, that's not what election means. He said, I'll tell you what election means. He said, it's like if we were a, a corporation here and someone were to elect me as president, then I would have the choice of, even, of either turning down that election or accepting that. And I said, no, you've redefined the whole concept of election now. You've taken it from like a political setting and tried to move that meaning over into a theological setting. And I said, it simply doesn't have that meaning. The scriptures won't bear that up at all. 
that God will elect us, and you can either accept that or turn that down. There is about a fourth twist, I'm afraid, on election in predestination. So if you own Dake or if you go out and purchase Dake, you will want to be careful of just a few of these items. And I'm sure there are a few more. I'm sure there are even some historical details that Dake is perhaps wrong on. Well, I gave you one, the gap theory. That's a historical detail he's wrong on. But I mean, I'm sure there are others in addition to that. But it's a little refreshing to know that we at least have one a direct, charismatic, annotated reference Bible, study Bible out there on the market today. All right, I'm going to move on. If you don't have any questions about Dake, I don't know what the price is. You'd have to check in CBD. Well, I just gave you one, John 3.16. Uh, but they'd use just, you know, they're all over the Bible. They'd use ones, God's not willing that any man should perish, but that every man would come to the knowledge of the truth. Um, God's long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish. You've got that twice, once in 1 Timothy 2 and again in 2 Peter chapter 3. Or how about, about the last verse in Revelation 22? That the bride and the church say, Come, and whosoever is a thirst, come. Let him come and drink of the water of life freely. Then say, Now, try to find out whether or not God's preordained you. It's just whosoever's thirsty, whoever's thirsty, let him come. Or John 3.16, or just many other passages, or many other whosoever will passages. And there's just a lot of narrative teaching, like in the book of Acts, where, of course, you've got election there also, uh, Acts 13, 48. But you've got some passages, most of them, where Paul simply preaches a message, or Peter preaches a message, and people simply respond. And we're not given a theological commentary on that. Like, a, now, here's what happened behind the scenes. God foreknew these people and elected them from all eternity to do what they're doing right now. We simply have the men saying, Men, brethren, what must we do to be saved? What must we do to be saved? And Peter says, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and you'll receive the remission of sins, and you'll be given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then we're not given a theological commentary. Uh, we have to go other places in the Bible to find that. That what's happening behind the scenes is that God himself has changed that person's mind and heart and given them the gift of repentance and grace and salvation and the gift of faith as well. Now I want to stick something in between numbers 7 and 8. I would just say put a note here that whenever we discuss the RSV, that last tape on the Revised Standard Bible, we looked at later editions of the RSV. The tape might even be entitled something along that line, later editions of the RSV. And a couple of those later editions happen to be study Bibles. The Oxford Annotated Bible of 1962. See, that's why I'm putting it here. It comes right after dates of 1961. The Oxford Annotated Bible of 1962. And the New Oxford Annotated Bible of 1977. They both use the RSV text, and they are both study Bibles. An annotated Bible means just that, a study Bible, a reference Bible with notes and things in it. The Oxford of 1962 and the New Oxford of 1977. Okay, let's just quickly go on here. I won't have a lot to say about the rest of these. Steak was the one I wanted to concentrate on this morning. Number eight, the Harper Study Bible of 1964. The Harper Study Bible of 1964. Now, before the first Oxford annotated, um, or after, before the second, rather, Oxford annotated Bible came along, which has really been a mainstay, if you go back and remember your notes in RSV, that's been a best-selling book, the new Oxford annotated uh, Bible, which contains the RSV text and notes. Before Oxford finished its two annotated Bibles, the Harper Study Bible, was really the mainstay for the RSV tradition. Harper Study Bible uses the RSV text, which is the old liberal mainstay Bible, remember. The Harper Study Bible is still in print today, and those today include the 1971 revision of the RSV's New Testament. And if I don't make some special comment, then you can know it contains notes, maps, concordance, outlines, you know, just things that would make it a study Bible. 
I understand that just recently a Harper Study Bible has come out with the NASB text as well. Harper Study Bible is available in RSV or NASB. Number nine, the Open Bible. 1975, the Open Bible. This is a very nice uh, conservative study Bible. It's available in KJV, NKJV, and NASB. Study Bibles take an existing text, and some of them are available in more translations than simply one. Now, it first came out in 1975, and then it came out 10 years later in an expanded edition. We're going to weary you by the time we're through with biblical literature this morning with all the various Bibles that are available. You've got to add this to all these that we've already studied. That's incredible. It has a 300-page biblical cyclopedic index. That's what the Open Bible is known for. A 300-page, now that's a good-sized book in itself, 300 pages. A 300-page biblical cyclopedic index that contains a list of 8,000 subjects and names and places and so forth. It has very good book introductions. It has very few notes, so it's mainly known for what comes before books and at the end of the Bible, and not for notes at the bottom of the page. It has some good sections at the back on topics like Between the Testaments, the Apocrypha, Archaeology, and the History of the English Bible. You can find a lot of the things, I'm sure. I didn't look it up, but I'm sure you can find a lot of the things I've said over the last few years on English translations, or really the, this last year, right here in the Open Bible in the back of it. Some of the contributors that you might uh, be familiar with are um, W.A. Criswell, famous Baptist pastor in Dallas, Merle F. Unger, Wilbur Smith, who with Henry and Archer founded Fuller Seminary, one of the founding faculty members, Wilbur Smith, Charles Pfeiffer, who taught at the University of Michigan for a number of years. I don't know if you know these others, but Harold Wilmington, uh, who did he work for? Was that Falwell? I think he worked for Falwell, Harold Wilmington. And uh, R.G. Lee. Lee is a famous Baptist pastor in Memphis, Tennessee. Many people go to Memphis Baptist. He's dead now, died not that long ago, but many uh, seminary Baptist students sat at the feet of Dr. Lee in his church in Memphis. So uh, here's another study Bible. I'm not going to pass all these around. I've got them up here, but they're just all just one book after another. You know, this another study Bible with these authors, and just you know, you can open up like here's a page on the miracles of Jesus in the back, all the miracles and where they're found in each of the Gospels, and you know what study Bibles are like by now. Then numbers 10 and 11 we'll put together. Number 10, the NEB, the New English Bible, the NEB with the Apocrypha. The Oxford Study Edition, 1976. And then number 11, the Cambridge Study Edition, NEB, 1977. Two study Bibles using the worst of all possible English translations, in my opinion. The New English Bible. This latter one, the Cambridge Study Edition, is now available, I understand, in loose-leaf notebook form with the text of the New American Standard Bible. I don't think you'd want to be tested over all these study Bibles here. Now, which study Bible contains which text? Now, is that the original edition or the expanded one? Oh, my. It just is a headache to use a figure of speech. 
just a figure of speech, but I trust you'll allow me to use it. Then number 12, Ryrie Study Bible. Ryrie Study Bible. 1978. Very, very popular study Bible by a theology professor at Dallas Seminary, Charles Ryrie. The notes are not that numerous, but certainly more than what you'd find in something like the Open Bible. And it's a distinctive, of course, is that it falls within the category of a Schofield dispensationalism. That's the distinctive of Ryrie Study Bible. It is available, I understand, in the King James text. In the New King James text, in the New American Standard, and in, most recently in the New International Version. If you have your um, Lowry Study Bible with you, some of you I see do out there, and you, or if you don't, you can just take a note of this. <laughs> you may want to know, you have to see if you're Ezra 8.35, we have a grievous mistake here. About one of the worst that you could ask for. The exiles, here's how mine reads, the exiles uh, who had come from the captivity offered burnt offerings to the God of Israel. Twelve bulls for all Israel, 96 rams, 77 lambs, 12 male goats, for a sin of the Lord. For a sin of the Lord. Now here's how it is in mind at the they've got a hyphen there because we're going to split that word offering. For a sin, and when they get back over here they forget to finish the word offering. For a sin of the Lord. Of course it's a printing mistake. They forgot to fill out the rest of the word offering and all you have is a sin of of the Lord, for a sin of the Lord. Does yours have that? All right, see, mine's an old, a very old, and must have, someone told them that. Some nitpicking person like myself told them that. <laughs> and they caught it and changed it later on. Mine goes back many years ago. Well, okay, so I thought we'd play around with Ezra 835. I guess we can if you don't have that. Number 13. The Linzel Study Bible. L-I-N-D-S-E-L-L. -L -L. The Linzell Study Bible of 1980. By the author of the famous book, The Battle for the Bible. We have a study Bible for the Living Bible. An S-B for L-B. Now I find that an odd conjunction. <laughs> <laughs> Can I make my little statement here? If you're so mentally weak you have to use the Living Bible, who are you to handle notes in a study Bible then? <laughs> I mean, the whole purpose of a living Bible is you can't handle anything. So that's probably an unfair statement, but I was going to make it anyway. The person is so mentally incompetent that you've got to, as your word of God, use the living Bible, which is like written to third graders. Remember, he wrote it to third graders. It's Kenneth Taylor, the living Bible. Then who do you think you are to be able to handle study notes of any kind? Well, Dr. Lenzo gave us almost 3,000 notes, and it reads very similar, by the way, to the NIV Study Bible. It happens to be good. By the way, the, the notes in Lenzo's Bible are better than the translation itself. If you've got the Bible, read the notes and leave the translation. The SB is better than the LB in this case. But you've got 3,000 notes at the bottom of the page. You've got also many other study aids. And this is one only, Lenzel's Bible is only for the Living Bible. But uh, I think that the notes at the bottom of the page are rather good. Lenzel's a good scholar in that sense of the word. And it reads somewhat like the NIV Study Bible. Number 14, the Master Study Bible, 1983. It is available in KJV, that's how I have it, and in NASV. And it's similar, Master Study Bible is very similar to the Open Bible. It contains a huge encyclopedia, 662 pages. Master Study Bible, 662 page encyclopedia. 
Uh, they even throw in A.T. Robertson's Harmony of the Gospels for free. That's a whole separate book, you see, that you have to buy. You buy Master Study Bible, and they'll even throw in a whole other book, A.T. Robertson's Harmony of the Gospels for free. There are no notes at the bottom of the page, or at the bottom of the pages, I should say. And the contributors to the Master Study Bible read like a veritable who's who of the evangelical church world. Here are just some of the names. I'm going to run through these quickly. Gleason Archer, Clarence Bass, Jeffrey Bromley, Wick Grunwell, uh, Gordon Clark, Ralph Earl, Earl Ellis, uh, John Gerstner, Burton Goddard, R. Laird Harris, Carl F. Henry, um, Philip Hughes, Kenneth Kitchen, George Ladd, H.C. Leupold, A. Berkeley Mickelson, Leon Morris, J.I. Packer, J. Barton Payne, J. Dwight Pentecost, Charles Pfeiffer, um, Merle Tenney, John Thompson, Merle F. Unger, Walter Wessel, E.J. Young, Douglas Young. Those are the, some of the ones I skipped over, some that I didn't think you'd know, from introductory outlines and surveys of Bible books. She got Harmony of the Gospels, The Life and Teachings of Jesus, Bible Prophecy, Reading and How to Read and Study the Bible by F.F. F. Bruce and William Foxwell Albright, An Encyclopedia to the Master Study Bible. I don't think you'd know most of those. Well, A.T. Robertson, I don't think you'd know most of those names, and so forth. And you get also a, a user's guide on how to operate for the Master Study Bible. Number 15, the Narrated Bible of 1984. You'll notice how many of these have been done just recently. The Narrated Bible. Now, I have used this Bible. I don't use most of those. I just, you say, well, why'd you buy them? Well, because I had to teach on them. So you can reimburse me now that I've <laughs> taught it off. <laughs> They're not any good to me. I don't spend a lot of time in that. But the Narrated Bible of 1984 is unique in that it does just what its name says. It puts the Bible in chronological order. It narrates the Bible. It puts everything in chronological order. It's available in the NIV text. So you don't have like, well, everything in the Old Testament, you're not just going to have, let's say, um, the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings will be mixed not only with wherever it might fit with Samuel or, or Chronicles, but with all the prophets as well. If they think that Isaiah is prophesying during the reign of a certain ruler, then they put his book or parts of his prophecy right there. And so you've got this whole book here. Just, it's all run together. You don't have like Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. It's all run together in one uh, um, harmony called the Narrated Bible. They also have interspersed with the text a running commentary that's printed in red letters. Let me see if I can find an example. All right, here I'm on, I can't tell you what book of the Bible. I'm just on page 596 that would concern wherever the Bible talks about um, the building of the temple. And here, before you get into the text, you've got some notes, and it begins with this running text in red, a red commentary. Perhaps Solomon's best known achievement is the building of the magnificent temple in Jerusalem, on and on and on. And then you start getting into uh, the actual places. Um, his contact with King Hiram, and you've got verses out beside. You're not, you don't even know what you're reading. You don't know what verse. You're just reading a story. It's like written as a story. And then you've got the verses out here beside it where these accounts are found right here. And all down this side as well. The whole story run together. You end up, of course, with the harmony of the Gospels. But more than that, when you get over to the book of Acts and you have Paul's epistles stuck in there, if they're fitting somewhere at that time, everything is done in chronological order. So I don't know how much this costs, but that would almost be worth owning if you're ever concerned about how these things should fit themselves together. Of course, this isn't infallible. Only the text in here is. How it's put together is their idea. For the most part, evangelicals, conservatives did this, they're going to be right. But people have disagreements and differences over how the Bible should be run together if you're going to narrate it. By the way, there are other narrated Bibles that we've skipped over. Other people have attempted to do the same thing. Uh, but I think the narrated Bible of 1984 is the best attempt to do that. And it's broken up in such a way that you have 365 uh, reading units. 
That's what each one of these things happens to be here. It's broken up into those so you can read a reading unit for that day, 365 reading units. Some of them are short and some of them are so long you couldn't get it read in one day because you've got to stay with it. That's the story and it takes a long time to tell the story. But I find that the narrated Bible is rather interesting in that regard. Number 16, the NIV Study Bible, 1985. The NIV Study Bible. That was the best-selling religious book in 1986. And in my opinion, it's the best study Bible you could possibly own. We know all about that. We've all read that. So we'll keep on going. Number 17, the New Catholic Study Bible, 1985. Done by Roman Catholic scholars for Roman Catholic people based on today's English version, TEV, or Good News for Modern Man. The New Catholic Study Bible, based on the text of TEV. Number 18, the Christian Life Bible, 1985, uses the text of NKJV. Oh, I don't want to go into any detail. It's the work of a pastor, Porter Barrington, and so forth, but I, I need to save some time this morning and keep on talking. Now, there's, there's a list of 18, either of the better known ones, like these last ones we've been discussing, or back to the first ones like, well, even G. Campbell Morgan's, ones that are representative to give us a feel for the whole of this century. But the list is almost endless of study Bibles. Don't think there are only 18. There are 18 times 18 study Bibles available out there. So here's just a partial list of a few more that are also rather well known. The Dixon New Analytical Study Bible, KJV. The People's Study Bible, Living Bible, LB. So that's along with Lenzel, the People's Study Bible. Life Application Bible. <laughs> Uh, it's just the New Testament, I think. Um, uh, it may be the whole Bible now, because they just came out with something in 1987. Uh, that's the Living Bible, Life Application Bible. You know, how to apply the Bible to your life. And here's a recent ad that I cut out. You can pass that around if you want to. And see. You'll see what they mean by that name. Notice the picture, too, just typical. It's typical of uh, Christian people. The Master Ark Study Bible. Not the Master, but the Master Art Study Bible. You can find ads for these in magazines. KJV. The Edinburgh Study Bible. KJV. The Discovery Bible, which is, I think, just the New Testament. That was just done three years ago. The NIV Study Bible. Now, this will be a different than our other NIV study. The NIV Study Bible which in 1985 has Schofield and Thompson's notes. That's kind of unusual. NIV study Bible with Schofield and Thompson's notes. Of course, that's not the NIV study Bible. That's the NIV text with Schofield and Thompson in it. The Good News study Bible, today's English version of 1986. Then you have study Bibles by private preachers. Copeland sends one out. Rama sends one out. You've got a Copeland and a Rama study Bible. Bibles, study Bibles by private preachers that give like Copeland's has his sermons. And if you run out of things to preach, you know, like if I've ever run out of something, I run to Copeland and look up real quickly my next sermon. Now, I might do that a couple of weeks from now. If I run out of something, or maybe I'll just say in the future, I'm going to go to Copeland's Bible to see what to preach. Oh, my. Copeland Study Bible. Or then you can add with this various multiple translation Bibles, where you're not really with study notes, but you've got multiple translations. I'll give you some examples. We've got many categories here to conclude with. These are multiple translation Bibles. The New Layman's Parallel Bible. The New Layman's Parallel, which gives you four columns per page with the text of NIV, 
KJV, RSV, and Living. The New Layman's Parallel Study Bible, NIV, KJV, RSV, and Living. Or the Comparative Study Bible, NIV, NASV, KJV, and Amplified. Or this is a new one they just done, 26 translations of the Holy Bible. Now you couldn't possibly fit that in one book, so they just have certain verses. 26 translations. But they omit, for some strange reason, TEV and NIV, and for the Old Testament, NASB. Or, if those don't satisfy you, you can spice up the above multiple translation Bibles by throwing in a little Greek and Hebrew. With that, <laughs> you can end up with things like the interlinear Greek-English New Testament. That's a famous one, by the way, which contains the KJV text by George Ricker Berry. It looks like this. I have all of these. I won't hold all of them up, though. Or the interlinear Greek English New Testament with NASB. That's this little small one. So if this happens to be your Bible that you're using and you want to see what the Greek has to say, then you've got the text of this along with your um, uh, along with your Greek. Or the interlinear Bible NIV, interlinear Greek English NIV. which I have, or the Hebrew-English Old Testament. This is an ancient one by Samuel Lee, which is KJV. Or you can really spice it up by throwing in the Greek with several translations in English. See, we're giving you a different category every time. You might not be able to recognize that. Or you can throw in the Hebrew and the Greek with different translations. For instance, the NIV, KJV, Parallel New Testament in Greek and English. That's an entirely different translation, different Bible, I mean. The NIV, KJV, Parallel New Testament in Greek and English. Or you could have the Hebrew Greek Key Study Bible. Then, in addition, we also have a variety. I sound like a hawk or a merchandiser up here. We also have a variety of so-called topical Bibles. They'll take a topic uh, like well, murder and then print every verse in the Bible that mentions it. Two of these are especially famous. We have knaves topical Bible, so these are TVs now, topical Bibles, Nave's topical Bible by Orville J. Nave. I'm glad his last name does not start with a K. It starts with an N. Poor boy if it had started with a K. Orville J. Nave, <laughs> N-A-V-E. He was a chaplain to the United States Army. He wrote the preface to his Knave's Topical Bible from Fort McPherson, Georgia. Why do you say that? Because my wife is from Fort McPherson, Georgia. I said that for her benefit. It is available in KJV or in LB. You understand what a Topical Bible is? All right, uh, lasciviousness. Or right, let's take something that's got law. Here's law. And you got every verse, it's like a dictionary, with the, you look it up in alphabetical order, everything under law is found anywhere in the Bible. You just go on and on and on. It's called a topical Bible. Names, or even a better known one, is Zondervan's topical Bible, which is available in KJV, bright color, Zondervan topical Bible. Now these are sometimes useful. If you want to study a certain issue, then you just look it up like you do in a dictionary. And it will give you, in their estimation anyway, every place I happen to like... Um, Zondervan's better than Knaves, but it'll give you every place in the Bible where you can find a reference to that. Like, uh, here's Jerusalem, and you've got many columns of where you can find Jerusalem. 
Or, if that doesn't suit you, then we have color-coded Bibles. Color-coded Bibles. Let me give you a few examples, what I'm, and then I'll tell you what I mean by color-coded. Color-coded Bibles. First example is the Topical Chain Study Bible, NASB. I've got to find it in the midst of all my things up here. You've got four different colors. Topical Chain Study Bible. Oh my, I don't even want to take the time looking for it behind the pulpit here. Four different colors used in this Bible to show the themes that are under discussion. If a passage deals with grace, then it's covered in red. Judgment is blue. Holiness is yellow. And sin is gray. Those are just four topics that the topical chain study Bible is a color-coded Bible. Or you could have the New Mark Reference Bible in KJV, where red is salvation, blue is prophecy, green is the Holy Spirit, and tan is blessing. Or you could have the Rainbow Study Bible. Now that's a good name there. The Rainbow Study Bible, KJV. In this Bible, every verse is color-coded to one of a dozen different themes. So you've got 12 colors you have to keep up with in your mind as you read. Now I have these. They're just ridiculous things. You open them and it does look like a rainbow on the inside. And every verse is coded to a certain color. If it speaks of like the return of Christ, the second advent, then it'll be colored a certain way. And you've got to memorize all the colorings in there and know what equals what coloring. It becomes a little confusing to say the least. Or you say, well, I'm not an adult, so those are too much for me. All right, we have children's Bibles. You can have the International Children's Bible, today's English version in children's language, children's editions of the NIV, RSV, and KJV. Precious Moments Bible, the Children's Learning Edition, Baby's First Bible, Holman's Children's Bible, Children's Living Bible, Young Reader's Illustrated Bible, Children's Personal Size Large Print Bible, Little Bible for Little Hands, the KJV Cambridge Picture Bible, NIV Young Discoverers Bible, the NIV Children's Bible, the Children's Edition of the NASB, the Good Shepherd Children's Bible in TEV, or the Read to Me Bible in NIV. Or you're between adult and childhood, you're a teen, all right? You can have the Disciple Youth Bible, the Transformer NKJV Bible, the Student Textbook Edition NKJV, the Student Bible NIV, the Light TEV, or the Source TEV. You believe all these Bibles are available for, you can probably find one for Barney Google, your dog in here. <laughs> That would fit him, you know, just have it coated with a little a smell, a meat smell on the outside of it, and it would fit him just well. Or, or, if none of this has satisfied you, if you're blind and you can't read, we have well-known talking Bibles. Well-known talking Bibles in KJV and NIV. This is the Bible on consent, by the way. If you're blind, then you can, you have a remedy for that. You can buy a talking Bible which is rather expensive, a whole set of cassettes to hear the Bible in KJV or NIV. Or finally, if you're of the space age mentality, then there are electronic Bibles. You have to own a computer for these to work, though. There are the electronic Bibles. I'll give you two examples. Now, here's what my research has shown me about Bible translations. The Bible research systems in Austin, Texas, has put the KJV and NIV on floppy disk. Bible Research Systems in Austin, Texas put the KJV and NIV on floppy disk. Another example of what we would call the electronic Bible, see I've given you names for these, study Bibles, topical Bibles, color-coded Bibles, um, Children's Bibles, Teens Bible, Talking Bibles, now Electronic Bibles, Word Publishing Company. They used to be in Waco. They just moved this year to Dallas. They couldn't make any money out of Waco. 
too far from everything. Word Publishing Company in Dallas has the KJV on floppy disk. Now, let me just conclude this morning with a few final thoughts on study Bibles. Well, I, can, I need to conclude with some thoughts on Bible translations in general. We've given you so many of these. Somehow, all of this business seems like nothing but publisher's greed to me. Amen. Somehow, it's compromising God's Word. Why can't people just be satisfied with one or two or three or four or five or six or seven or eight or nine or ten or eleven or twelve or thirteen translations? We're going to have to keep on counting until the cows come home to finish how many translations are out there. For every type of person, whatever type of background, Catholic, liberal, Protestant, evangelical, charismatic, young, old, blind, deaf, you know, for every type of person, you have a Bible available, some type of study Bible available, some type of reference Bible available. I think that for the most part, the people that use study Bibles, this has been true in my experience of watching people, carry their study Bibles with them. And I think that's going to become self-defeating if the people who are publishing them are godly, honest, honest people in the first place. What you want to do is to get people in God's Word. But what happens, I find, is that people who use a study Bible, and I mean use it as their regular Bible, not like you might read one, but who, for them, that is their Bible. Ryrie is their Bible. Schofield is their Bible. Thompson is their Bible. Now, I know it has a translation in it, but part of what they think of as Bible is not just a translation, but notes at the same time. And it must be the work of the devil, because for some reason, people seem to remember the notes better than they remember the text. I have had people tell me, no, that's not in the Bible because, and they'll quote me something, they're quoting me Schofield's notes, not what's in the Bible. They're quoting you Ryrie's notes, not what's in God's Word. Study Bibles are okay, they have their place as long as we recognize what's going on here. They shouldn't be carried around as our normal, regular, major, personal Bible that we use. Because your eyes always are dropping to the bottom of the page to see what man had to say about what God had to say. Now, it's all right to study some of it and try to understand, well, what is the passage saying here? But when you make that the mainstay, your personal translation, I think experience proves that, that um, people often remember the notes more than they remember the biblical text. And it seems like publishers agreed to me. You're trying to package as many things as possible in one box to get the public to buy it. I would say in the long run, it's almost even for them self-defeating. You could be selling, you know, that ad I gave you with Thompson Chain Reference Bible, a Bible, then have to turn around and sell the person a Bible dictionary, then turn around and sell them a book on archaeology, and it's self-defeating. You're putting all that in one book for them. But I think they know the buying public out there very well. They're not going to buy those books. They're not going to go out and buy a book on geography and what have you, and archaeology. But if you'll put all that in a Bible for them, and say, you'll never again need these other books, just let your fingers do the walking through Thompson's book here, then you're going to sell a lot of those. And experience has proven they have sold a lot of those. Publishers greed. Mixing man's word with God's word for their own financial gain. They know they're going to make more money because they're going to sell more Bibles because they packaged more in one box than what they did in traditional times, where you got the Bible or you didn't. You didn't get the Bible and something else. So I personally am opposed to study Bibles as a normal Bible carried or used by a person. They have a place just like their commentaries, what they are. Uh, if you can't own a study Bible, you couldn't own commentaries either. If you couldn't use a study Bible, you couldn't use commentaries. That's what it is, a commentary. But to bring commentaries with us to church or wherever we go that this is our, our Bible here and it's God's Word mixed with man's Word, I would have a serious problem with that. And I just have a problem with the flood of those that are available today. There's just too many available. I think it's saying something about our generation. And just what that is, I'll say later on. All right, so an end to study Bibles. We went a little long, but we're through with those. A couple of weeks from now, we're going to be getting into a slightly different area. I won't even tell you what that is, but it'll be very interesting, and we'll be there for three or four weeks, I'm sure.